Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Michaela Cleaver. I'm the SPS Programs Coordinator. Uh, thank you for joining us for another virtual colloquium. Uh, today, we are lucky enough to have Dr. Colleen Countryman back with us. Uh, she works at Ithaca College, and she'll be discussing remote labs for introductory physics. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or raise your hand, I think. Um, and then we will jump, we will answer questions as we come along. So thank you, Colleen. Great, awesome. Thanks so much, Michaela. Um, hi, everybody. I, I I know that this is set up as a webinar, but I do um, very much invite um, collaboration and discussion. So if you do have questions or if you have something that you want to add, we're going to be talking about a lot of different resources that instructors can use um, for introductory physics, particularly in kind of the remote or hybrid environment. And um, so if you have things you'd like to add, I, I invite you please um, to uh, share them uh, in the chat. Um, Kayla has uh, generously offered to sort of copy and paste those out to everybody. So it might look like you're just um, messaging us directly, but, um, but it will go out to everybody. So um, yeah, hi, I'm Colleen Countryman. I'm an assistant professor in physics and astronomy at Ithaca College, and um, yeah, I feel really honored to be a part of the SBS seminar series, so thanks so much for inviting me. I want to talk a little bit about remote labs for introductory physics, and as Michaela and I were just chatting about, um, uh, it is somewhat nice to hear that um, it seems like our, our, our pandemic is starting to come to an end, that there's a bit of a light at the end of that tunnel. But it is also, I think, worth mentioning that some aspects of our kind of in, during pandemic teaching may end up um, extending uh, beyond the pandemic and um, that, that we might be able to take advantage of um, some of these remote learning opportunities, uh, even as we forge forward. So um, yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about the objectives of the uh, webinar today. So. We're going to be talking about incorporating online resources and even just some common household materials into remote learning experiences. Um, physics, I think, is really nice in that um, it is all around us, and particularly if you're teaching like an introductory mechanics sort of a class um, that that you can really take advantage of all the equipment that you have even just at your house. Um, and we can have students do the same and, and really do some, I think, pretty robust labs based on that. We'll demonstrate some data collection methods using mobile technologies. So um, uh, just making use of student smartphones and things like that. And then we'll actually talk a little bit about how smartphones collect data. Before we get into all that, though, I just wanted to talk a little bit about course structure, um, because uh, obviously the way that you've structured your course will impact the way that these labs um, might be uh, distributed. So um, as we as we get into this, I'd like to just sort of invite people to uh, maybe chime in and tell us some challenges that you've had either as a student or as an instructor um, in the remote learning environment. So what sort of pedagogical challenges have you encountered? What, what has been really challenging aspects of this? And, and I'll ask uh, Michaela to, uh, yeah, excellent. Yeah, please feel free to raise your hand to speak. Uh, I can unmute people, <laughs> I have that ability. So um, yeah, please feel free to, to share any, environment, uh, any experiences you've had here. Yeah. Yeah, lack of engagement and accountability. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one thing that um, certainly I've been struggling with um, in my own classes is just how do we how do we continue to engage people, right? How do we engage other students? How do we engage, um, you know, uh, the, the the students that are particularly those that are really struggling? And how do you come? How do you hold them accountable, right? Um, this is particularly hard when you know we're um, allowing them to like keep cameras off and things like that, right? How do we really know that they're um, doing the work? Um, and uh, one person suggests here as an instructor, yeah, challenging to work with students who are in person and remote simultaneously. Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think trying to find a balance, sort of strike a balance between those two, um, can be a real uh, can be a real challenge there. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about um, kind of solutions to at least some of these um, some of these issues as we move forward. So. As we do that, it's really important to keep in mind just the learning objectives of our courses. This is really where any course design should start, and this is where any activity for courses should begin. And um, in order to do this, we should really think about how we might need to adapt our learning um, objectives for the online environment. Um, I think we've all probably felt 
that maybe we haven't been able to cover quite as much or maybe not quite as in much depth as we had previously. And, um, and so how, how can we adapt to that, right? Um, and I think that there are some ways in which, at least I found, um, that the remote environment is actually maybe more effective at um, getting at students with uh, certain concepts. So yeah, these are, um, these are learning objectives that should be sort of at the core of the course design, regardless of the modality, regardless of if you're um, taking the class in person or remotely or hybrid. And it's not just restricted to the course content, but also sort of these big picture skills. So um, these skills might involve thinking like a physicist or developing problem solving or developing reasoning and metacognitive skills and things like that. Um, and of course, we should also consider the equity issues as you develop your learning objectives. Uh, one thing that I want to point out is that a lot of these resources that I, uh, I'll be discussing today came from various articles that came out during the pandemic. Um, many of them came from FISPORT, which is a fantastic research uh, resource for uh, physics instructors. So I'd recommend uh, checking out uh, the, the resources there. I think they're, they're pretty incredible. Um, so yeah, there are some options in course structure, and in fact, a, a few of these have already been mentioned, right? This idea that you might have a fully synchronous remote environment. So that's one where kind of like what we're doing right now over Zoom, where you can kind of interact with everybody and they can interact with you. Fully asynchronous would be, you know, maybe you're creating classroom videos and putting them up on some sort of online repository like YouTube or something like that, Kaltura, one of those. Then there's, you can do a mix of synchronous and asynchronous, and um, there's some research that indicates that that might be uh, very beneficial to students, that you kind of get the best of both worlds in this way. And, uh, and hybrid is um, a, when you have some students that are in person and some students that are working remotely, and typically that's um, taught in a fully uh, synchronous um, session. Now, I think what's what's important to think about here um, today in our in our little uh, seminar here is uh, is yeah you can do synchronous and record it and they can watch it later. That is uh, that was one suggestion from one of our attendees, which is absolutely true. Yeah, that's certainly another option, which is sort of a mix of synchronous and asynchronous. So the line between these is blurred a bit, right? And I think it's only just continuing to blur as time goes on. Today we're going to be focusing on labs that can be done remotely, um, which is, you know, kind of regardless of the potential for, for in-person uh, lecture. Um, and one other thing that I want to encourage instructors to think about is the fact that, that you might want to reassess your modality throughout the semester. Um, you know, these are really extraordinary circumstances. And so students' thoughts on modality may change with time. And in fact, that has occurred with a couple of the courses that I've taught. Um, where we started off one way based on, you know, I, I was um, administering some surveys to get students thoughts on things and, and then they realized, oh no, maybe I, I don't want it fully asynchronous, maybe I am better off um, with the synchronous session or vice versa. Um, and so I, I'd encourage you, of course, to check in with students and um, find out what works well for them because what works well in one class might not work well in another. And in fact, I found this myself. Um, uh, the last spring, I was teaching an introductory physics course for physics majors, as well as an advanced course for physics majors. And overwhelmingly, the introductory students preferred the asynchronous video sessions, and overwhelmingly, the advanced students preferred the synchronous sessions. And so, just knowing that um, you know this is not kind of a one size fits all sort of uh, situation here. Um, but yeah, let's actually think about how, how can we best handle labs in these environments, right? And one thing that I think is important to keep in mind is that many aspects of labs can work in any modality. So, so you can, for example, do pre and post lab assignments. You can develop questions to investigate. You can interpret data and create models and so on in any modality, whether you're remote or, um, or in person. There are, of course, some pieces that are impacted by modality, like observing things, right? Um, figuring out how to do that if, if it's going to be like the instructor performs the lab and maybe students provide feedback on what the next step is to do. Um, that's certainly one option. Or do students perform the lab on their own and then all come together to uh, perhaps interpret the data, things like that. Designing the experiment, collecting the data, et cetera. These are things that are impacted by modality. And, and 
I want to point out that not all of these divisions are clear cut either, right? Um, the key, of course, is that only some aspects of the lab are impacted by modality. And I think this is the part of it that we can really take advantage of. So we can address some challenges of remote labs. Um, you know, I, I've, I've got kind of this, this triangle showing increased engagement. And this isn't, you know, um, hard and fast uh, ordering here, but sort of roughly, I think the, the most engaging sorts of lab activities are those that use basic equipment from home, something that the students can physically manipulate on their own, um, or uh, using a kit lent to a student. That's something um, that's done at several universities. Um, or conducting a guided exploration of simulations of physical phenomena. And in some cases, uh, in fact, there, there was a, um, an article that came out in 2005 by the folks at CU Boulder, Noah Finkelstein, among others, um, that said that actually some labs actually work better as a virtual experiment. This is particularly true in electromagnetism classes where um, you can't physically see electrons move, right? You can only kind of observe the effects of the movements of electrons. And so, um, so yeah, how can we actually uh, take advantage of the virtual environment um, in which students can explore physical phenomena, right? Um, with simulation of a circuit, you can actually see those little electrons marching through the wires and so on. Um, and then kind of as you uh, move down this list, you get into less engaging um, activities. Watching a video of an experiment is a bit more passive, um, but perhaps if you allow some interaction with your students, right, like, okay, you know, I've connected these two wires, what should I do next? That can help um, to improve the engagement there. So um, yeah, I'd love to um, talk a little bit about some of your favorite resources. And we're going to, um, uh, perhaps this slide is a little bit premature, but we are gonna discuss some online resources. But yeah, I would love to hear if you want to um, perhaps uh, uh, maybe raise your hand and I can um, unmute you to just tell us a little bit about uh, a couple of your favorite resources. Anyone brave enough? <laughs> Not yet. I understand. Okay. All right. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm going to move on. I will talk about some of my own. And then um, as we move into the webinar further, if you do think of things um, that uh, that I haven't discussed, then um, we'll, we'll be certain to uh, take a look at those. Excellent. All right. So first off, I want to just talk about some of the mechanics lab ideas. And these um, primarily came out of, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Brendan, go ahead. Uh, let me, yeah, allow you to talk. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, I just wanted to mention, sorry, I was a little slow there, but no worries. Uh, there was, I think, a Lawrence Livermore uh, remote lab activities that uses the Firefox app a lot. Did you see those? No, I have not seen those. Um, it was by, I'm, I'm trying to find it now. I can, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, um, yeah, please do. Yeah, I'd be really interested to see those. Yeah, they were fantastic. And it was uh, a whole lot of PowerPoint presentations that were also made in conjunction. And, and so like, they had lots of detailed hands on experiments that oh, we great. relied on heavily for the, the mechanics labs. Fantastic. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much, Brendan. I, I really appreciate it. That's great. <laughs> Um, excellent. Yeah. So uh, uh, in addition, I, I wanted to, to share, yeah, just some of the activities that I used in the mechanics class that I taught this past fall, which was fully remote. And um, I want to just sort of, for some context, provide you with some information about how the class was structured. So um, we Typically, the, the class is a, a scale up class. It's an active learning style class with an integrated lab and lecture. So instead of meeting three times a week for an hour each, plus a lab, we actually combine those so that we meet three times a week for two hours each. And so we can kind of integrate the lab and the lecture um, all in one. So because we had these two hour blocks, um, I was kind of concerned about Zoom fatigue. Um, and I apologize if you're suffering from that right now after potentially a long day. Um, so uh, I wanted to, to 
to kind of break up this monotony. So what I did was I uh, mixed the synchronous and the asynchronous components of the course. So each class day was composed of approximately an hour's worth of videos that students could watch on their own. They could pace themselves, they could pause, rewind, et cetera, which they really preferred. And so this was the primary course content delivery. And then um, we, I, I basically took that hour of synchronous time and turned it into Coffee with Colleen, which was an optional hour um, that's basically office hours, but uh, I invited students to come in and talk about anything that they wanted with priority given to physics questions. And, um, and so I knew that everybody had that time available. And then we had the synchronous team meetups during that second hour. So every, everybody had come in having watched the videos, having seen the course content, sort of the classic flipped classroom style. And then in that second hour, they could all work together and um, share, uh, share their own ideas here. So um, uh, that was that was the, the primary uh, course focus. The course itself was a, a typical Phys 101 type class uh, that was aimed at um, mostly physical therapy majors and other life science majors. So in that second hour of the class, that synchronous um, team meetup session, we spent a lot of time doing mini labs. And um, I really did try to take advantage of the fact that students had equipment that they had at home that we could use. So I didn't require them to purchase anything other than just a tape measure if they didn't have one. Um, and from that, we were able to do a lot of different labs. So um, one of the things that I, I found really helpful that really inspired me were uh, Natasha Holmes' uh, series of labs from Cornell. Um, she's a physics education researcher there. Um, and she developed the Thinking Critically Labs. There was an article, fascinating article, published in Physics Today a couple of years ago about her introductory physics lab sequence. And what they found was that the labs themselves are actually more effective when the goal is to teach the, the skills rather than the content, right? So if you're doing a torque lab, the focus shouldn't necessarily be on torque, but it should be on the experimental skill sets that you can gain and then use further later. And so that was um, something that really inspired the first several labs that um, I incorporated into my class. So the introductory lab, in our case, we just introduced experimental physics and critical thinking through experimentation. We, um, I did a really basic lab with a pendulum. This was literally day one. We hadn't talked about anything. We hadn't talked about simple harmonic motion or restorative forces or anything like that. Um, I just asked them to do some really basic calculations with like, hey, I want you to, to time this pendulum. So I demonstrated the pendulum for them. And then we focused on the skill sets like teamwork and um, reliability and doing some really basic data calculations. But the emphasis um, was not to confirm the theory in class, but to just get some practice with these skills. And I, I found that um, incredibly freeing. Uh, this is one of the graphs uh, from their Physics Today uh, article. And what I think is really fascinating here is that it really shows um, what students self-reported that they were most engaged in. And so the um, top row here of graphs shows uh, undergraduate research experiences, then uh, project labs, which are effectively all student guided, and then some more structured labs that tend to be of the more confirmatory sort of classic more traditional lab style. And um, the key here, I think, is that the, the structured labs uh, that tend to be these more confirmatory labs are not as engaging as the ones in which students got to define their own path. And so I, I think, uh, you know, what I tried to do was really take advantage of them being able to define their own path. Um, and our classes were small enough. I mean, it was 99 students, but um, working in groups of three, you know, I'm grading uh, 33 lab reports, which wasn't too bad. So I'm um, really taking full advantage of them really kind of uh, creating their own path here. Um, we also did some analysis from pre-recorded data. So uh, this was just a really basic video of, in fact, this is my partner. We were on a um, bike trip and he had an apple core that he threw off of one of the more famous gorges here in Ithaca. And um, so just using the time of the fall, uh, we asked students to uh, determine the height that we were at and kind of compared that to um, the engineering data for, for the height of that bridge. 
Um, we also did something similar with Usain Bolt. I actually found that somebody had analyzed his speed versus time in his world record breaking uh, Beijing Olympic race. And so this is similar to kind of Pivot Interactives. If you've used that before, it's a phenomenal resource. Um, it does cost, um, I think it's $5 per semester per student, um, but it's got a huge compendium of uh, videos and uh, you can then use their data analysis tools to get some information about um, the movement of real humans in some cases or real objects um, in the physical world. So uh, we also used Tracker, right, which is the free video analysis software created by uh, Douglas Brown and Wolfgang Christian, Robert Hansen. Um, Pasco SparkView does something um, kind of similar, but does not have all of the um, video analysis. So you would need to kind of upgrade to a Pasco Capstone or Vernier video analysis, um, which are a bit more costly. Um, but yeah, from this, we were actually able to design our own sort of kinematics problem. So I was able to exactly measure the speed, you know, that I threw the ball at and the angle that I threw the ball at. And, um, and then from there, we're able to actually confirm how close our kinematic predictions were to the real thing. And, and so having um, students perform um, that sort of problem solving exercise, I think, uh, worked out really well. We also looked at transfer of momentum, um, and this is using just some uh, uh, lab equipment from class. So we have a couple of carts here, which are effectively switching velocities uh, due to an elastic collision. And so again, we're, we're making use of, um, of tracker there. Um, there are some sort of uh, prototypes of uh, the um, of the uh, videos that that have been analyzed on Pivot Interactives um, that are available for free on YouTube. So this is one of a, a child jumping jumping on a trampoline, and so you know we can analyze this video in terms of you know of course their elastic potential energy uh, transferring into gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy and so on. So doing things like that can be really helpful as well. And then we also just used smartphone apps uh, to collect data. So we were able to do a really simple friction experiment where we just had a uh, inclined surface. You know, it could be something as simple as just a, a binder or something like that. A nice flat inclined surface. And then you can put your phone on that inclined surface. You can download um, or, or just use often the, the built-in apps using either Measure on iPhone or the Google app on Android. Uh, you can actually find exactly the angle that your phone is at. And so you can find the angle at which the phone is going to start sliding on its own um, down, that, uh, down that surface and, and do some uh, fairly rigorous analysis uh, based on uh, the, the free body diagram of the, the phone on the incline. We also, of course, used FET simulations. These were developed by the group, uh, the PER group at CU Boulder. They're incredibly powerful, and I think um, probably a lot of you are aware of them already, so I won't discuss them in detail, um, but, uh, but they're absolutely some of my favorite simulations that exist online. We also uh, used some common household equipment. So we did like a coefficient of restitution lab just using a ball that bounces at their house. That was all I asked them for. And, um, you know, of course, you're able to, to analyze, uh, you know, from kind of a conservation of energy perspective, how much energy is lost in the bounce and therefore obtain uh, the coefficient of restitution based on that. We can also do, and, and even though this, this seems maybe like a, a less exciting sort of a lab, uh, but just getting some basic skills in measurement, um, I think are really important. So we performed a phone density experiment where um, students were asked to find the density of their smartphone. Um, and so we asked them to just look up the maps on their phone and then uh, measuring the dimensions using a ruler. And we were very uh, careful about sig figs and things like that. But here again, this focus was on the experimental technique rather than the concept of density. That wasn't something we were necessarily focused on at that time, but much more, more so on the techniques themselves. 
We also uh, used some common household equipment. So we had a center of mass mini lab, make use of uh, the student's own, own body and items around the house. And so we did some really simple experiments like stand with your toes and nose touching the wall, putting your hands behind your back and try to stand on your tiptoes. And uh, you can't do that uh, because your uh, center of mass ends up kind of behind you. And so you can't support your own weight because your center of mass is sort of behind the uh, point of application of that force. So uh, it does not work. And you can do some, some similar sorts of experiments based on that. So um, again, just making use of the things that are around us. And I think it's easier, especially in, in a mechanics lab to do something uh, like that. Um, we also just did some some really basic demonstrations like of torque and so um, because this was a physical therapy primarily physical therapy uh, minded uh, class population we focused on a lot of uh, applications for the human body. So we talked about the biceps and how they can support a weight in one's hand. And I showed this using a really rudimentary demonstration. There's a wooden dowel here on the ground with a weight sort of strapped to the end of it, which is meant to represent the weight in the person's hand. And then this belt strap here um, is meant to represent the bicep pulling up on the forearm and supporting that weight. And so discussing um, things like this. Excellent. So um, great. And there is uh, another series of simulations that um, I did want to discuss. And this is coming straight out of um, our own education research lab at, um, at Ithaca College. Uh, my group who um, our incredibly talented undergraduate physics majors um, have made an electric field simulator and an electric field game. And so um, I'll just show those briefly here. Let me, I just need to generate a new share. Um, so here we have uh, a charge. And I think this is uh, perhaps maybe slightly more robust than some of the other electric field simulators that are available. But here you can see, um, you know, the electric field um, as a, a vector map, you can add other charges, move them around and the electric field lines actually change dynamically as you move um, the configuration around. There's also a test charge mode. So you can show what happens if you release a test charge from a particular position. And one of the things, in fact, uh, one of the things that really inspired uh, the primary developer, Ted Mburu, um, in this, in creating this simulation was the fact that this test charge does not exactly, the trajectory of the test charge does not exactly follow the electric field lines. And that's something that um, I think contradicts students' intuition. And so um, this gives a really, I think, a nice way of seeing that. In fact, you can create an entire map of test charges. And it is actually really smooth um, uh, when you uh, try it sort of uh, in person rather than me just showing it over Zoom. It's a little bit more challenging. I'll, I'll drop that in the chat. We also have uh, an electric field game where we've tried to uh, improve students' engagement um, through, uh, oh, sorry, I'll need to create a new share here as well. Um, here we go. Sorry, bear with me. There it is. Um, so we've tried to kind of make this more fun by uh, making a track where uh, students can uh, add electric, uh, sorry, add charges, which then generate an electric field. And then this test charge, when you hit play, uh, we'll kind of zoom along. You can collect the stars as you go for bonus and then um, make its way to the end of the track. So this is something else that is, of course, just in development, but something that we found, um, I found really useful in my electromagnetism courses as well. So I'll drop that in there too. Um, I also wanted to just share um, some uh, additional resources. Oh, excuse me. And I've I've lost my spot here on my, here we are. Great, okay, let's change my sharing. All right, here we go. So yeah, the uh, FETs from CU Boulder, I hope, I hope you're seeing that okay. The FETs from CU Boulder are again, one of my favorites. They have, um, if you're not familiar, a ton of physics simulations and they are all uh, research-based um, and they're organized by topic, which I find really helpful. Many of them have been uh, written into HTML5 
or have been kind of ported into HTML5 so that they run on tablets and uh, smartphones as well. The O physics simulations are also incredibly powerful. Um, there's quite a few of these as well here. I just happen to uh, have opened the, the kinematics one. What I really like about this is that, um, again, it's sort of dynamic that you can change, you know, for example, the acceleration versus time curve and see an immediate effect, <clears throat> effect in the uh, position versus time curve. And they have quite a few um, different ones that are all organized, again, by topic. I mentioned previously Vermeer's Pivot Interactives, which again, series of videos where the, um, the data analysis tools, the video analysis tools are actually built right into sort of the simulation. Fizzlet simulations, of course, um, have been primarily developed by uh, Wolfgang Christian, Mario Bologna um, out of Davidson College in North Carolina. Um, and they too have developed, I think, a really, um, uh, uh, very full set of simulations that are worth checking out. There are some calculator card stacks, which I really enjoy. These are built on the Desmos uh, graphing calculator um, simulation or emulation. Um, what I really like about these is that uh, you can actually kind of, it's almost like taking index cards and physically matching up these index cards, um, which I, I really like. So they've got uh, motion diagrams and position graphs that you have to try to match one on top of the other and so on and kind of progress your way through this series of index cards. Uh, GeoGebra, oh, sorry, GeoGebra is another um, sort of calculator emulator, um, but they have, uh, I think, a fantastic repository of activities. And uh, you'll see um, some names in here are uh, come up quite frequently. These are worth checking out as well. Um, there are some great resources just for creating concept maps and sort of using them as, as whiteboards that are worth checking out. Google Jamboard is one of them. And the AWW app, has, which has now been kind of bought by Miro, is uh, worth checking out as well. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, I didn't log in. But, um, but yeah, you can uh, just create some basic shapes in here. Everybody can collaborate on these. You can add text to them. So I find that they're really fantastic for, for use as uh, in concept maps. And then um, I was actually giving a presentation similar to this one just a couple of weeks ago um, to a group in North Carolina for the Shape Conference. And um, Helen Reynolds offered this um, giant index of simulations. Um, and I will, I will drop this in the chat because um, <clears throat> I think that this is one of the most complete lists of resources that I've found for um, physicists and physics instructors that's out there. And these are all organized by topic as well, topic and even subtopic within them. Um, and it is, it kind of just goes on and on. <laughs> um, but it is really worth checking out. You should notice that there are some other tabs down here at the bottom, like for videos and stories and um, the DMVs, which are uh, sort of the predecessor of pivot interactive videos, <clears throat> direct motion videos, I believe is what they stand for. Um, these are all absolutely worth checking out because they include so many of the websites that we were just talking about a minute ago, um, such as uh, the, the FETs and Vernon Pivot Interactives and uh, Classroom, as well as many others um, that are perhaps not quite as uh, well known. So um, yeah, if you do have additional resources that you would like to share, please, um, I invite you to share them in maybe the Q&A or in the chat. And, um, and uh, I, I, Michaela has offered to share those out with everyone. Excellent. So um, yeah, at this point, I think I'd like to, to switch to just talking about the role of mobile technologies in a remote classroom. Um, we talked about this a little bit, that we can use um, some really basic apps, just those that are already built into the phone to um, for data collection, right? We're actually able to get um, things like, oh, yes, I'm sorry, let me move the, oh, the internet window. Thank you so much. Um, for that reminder, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so yeah, we're able to get um, more information 
uh, directly out of the phone itself. The phone contains several sensors within it, such as an accelerometer, a gyroscope to measure the rotational velocity of the phone, as well as um, as well as the uh, the magnetometer. And it's true, yeah, I see here um, a note uh, that somebody here does not own a smartphone, but we can assume that you know most, if not all students do have a smartphone. And uh, yeah, I do, I do think that's a safe assumption. Um, I actually did my dissertation in um, sort of smartphone app development and assessment for physics uh, classrooms. And we started doing surveys back in 2012 because we wanted to determine just how many students do have a smartphone. And uh, at NC State in our introductory, you know, our large, large enrollment introductory classes in 2012, 97% of the students had a smartphone. <laughs> um, and that was obviously many years ago now. Um, and since then, that, that number has only grown. Um, and even in, you know, we were going to some very rural high school and things like that, um, the, the number was similar. So um, we found that if you're in person, you can um, just ask for students to work together. So if there are students that don't have a smartphone, you can um, have them work together and uh, achieve the same, the same pedagogical results, which is good. So yeah, I mean, if you think about the fact that, that these phones do have internal sensors, it's best for us to just really think about what those sensors are detecting and, and how they're detecting that information. And one of the most useful detectors of, of the three that I mentioned, the accelerometer, the gyroscope, and the magnetometer, one of the three most useful ones is the accelerometer. So I'm going to be focusing a lot on um, the accelerometer here. Um, the accelerometer is the sensor on the phone that tells it sort of what orientation it has, you know, if it's portrait or landscape. And so um, what we're going to do is uh, I'd like to show you um, an app that uh, I worked on together with a team. And so I'm going to um, create a new share here. Here we are. And this is the uh, NCSU MyTech app, which if you'd like to, you can um, downloaded, it's free. I, I don't like make money off of how many people download it or anything like that. Um, so don't feel like you need to. And I'm sorry, let me uh, I have to enable screen sharing on my phone here. There we are. <clears throat> so, um, so excellent. So right now, and there's a little bit of a delay because um, I'm connecting my phone wirelessly to Zoom and then there's some time for that to reach you as well. But the um, yeah, can, I cannot assume that all phones ha students have a smartphone. Yeah, I agree that that we we shouldn't assume that all students have a smartphone. Um, we, most do, and I think it is important to um, confirm that before you require them, for example, to um, to have one in uh, uh, in in doing their labs. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, thank you so much um, for for offering that. Um, okay, great. So what are we taking a look at here? So what we're seeing here is actually the motion of the phone. We're actually seeing um, the, the raw data coming out of the accelerometer along the X, Y, and Z axes. And, and if you look kind of in the lower right of this plot, you'll see um, a legend here, which, which shows us uh, what each color corresponds to. And uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll turn on um, our colorblind mode here, our sort of high contrast mode, just in case we have any colorblind attendees. So um, the red here, the one pointing to the right, that's our A sub X. Um, up is A sub Y and kind of out of the screen at us is A sub Z. And one thing that you might note here is even if I hold the, so, you know, if I move the phone, we, we see motion, of course, in, you know, each of, along each of those axes. Um, but one thing that you might notice is that if I hold the phone stationary, and I'm doing my best here to do that, we see that uh, A sub X and A sub Z are, are pretty darn close to zero, a little jittery because I had coffee today. Um, but A sub Y seems to be um, pretty close to about negative 9.8. It's kind of hovering right, right around there, negative 9.7, 9.8-ish. And so what's what's happening is we're reading G, and that's that's confusing for for student, for students, because the phone is not actually accelerating. This, the, the phone right now is, is completely stationary. So why is it that, that we're reading an acceleration of G? And this, I think, offers a really uh, exciting learning opportunity for students. 
because it's really getting at how the data is collected by the phone. So we can kind of peel back what's going on inside the phone because the phone is often thought of as, as something of a black box. And we can do that by hitting this button in the lower left, which uh, shows us a mass on a spring. And that's effectively what's happening inside the phone. This is effectively the accelerometer in the Y direction. And when I hit the graph button, what we're seeing here is the plot of this mass on the spring as I sort of move the phone up and down. So what we're actually reading here is not truly the acceleration of the phone. We're actually reading something like the force of this spring on this mass. That is the force that's sort of keeping this mass up. It's really like a support force that we're reading. Now we can adjust this by um, hitting this little G button in the lower right, so I'll do that. And when we do that, it effectively uh, corrects for uh, gravity, right? So it's able to, to make a prediction as to where gravity is. And now we're reading the true acceleration of the phone. So the true acceleration of the phone, because it's more or less stationary, is more or less zero, which is what we would expect. So this offers us an opportunity to talk about, and I'll, I'll switch back here to my PowerPoint, this offers us an opportunity to talk about something called the Einstein equivalence principle. Um, and this, I think, is really exciting because it's, it's a question that comes up frequently, uh, particularly with in introductory students. And I think it's exciting because it gives them an opportunity to talk about something that they wouldn't otherwise have seen had they taken um, you know, physics at, at a high school level. So the, the whole idea of Einstein's equivalence principle is that the phone treats the gravitational force as it would any other force. So effectively, the phone doesn't know the difference between being in a gravitational field, like the one that exists near the surface of the Earth, and being in a rocket that is accelerating up at G. It doesn't recognize the difference between those two things. In other words, these two situations are equivalent as, phone, as far as the, the phone is concerned. So it helps us then to think about that accelerometer the same way that we would think about a, uh, a spring measurement, right? A spring, a spring force measurement, spring scale. So with a spring scale, if you attach a mass to the bottom of it, it's going to read the weight of that mass. That accelerometer, in this case, is reading the force on this spring, right? And that's what we were seeing the phone do as well. But if you drop the spring scale with the mass, for example, in free fall, that spring scale and the weight experience something like weightlessness, right? Because they're both moving um, at the same rate, and therefore um, it seems as though that mass doesn't actually exist. And so that same thing happens with the phone. And, and you can use that spring scale, therefore, as something of like an analogy between um, the spring scale and what's actually happening inside the accelerometer. Now, the accelerometer, I think, is really, really clever. It's a really tiny chip. This is an older iPhone, but it's, it's no larger than um, the tip of an eraser. It is a MEMS chip, a mic microelectromechanical chip. And it does actually have physically moving parts inside of it. It has what we call a seismic mass, which is allowed to move back and forth. And it has, um, uh, it effectively has capacitor walls on it. So what's happening is as the phone is moving, the capacitance is changing, and therefore this, the uh, current through that circuit is changing, and the phone software then uh, converts that into an acceleration. So that, that difference in capacitance, sort of that applied acceleration causing a change in capacitance is then what the phone reads. And we can actually see these physically moving parts. Um, there is something like a spring within this uh, micro uh, electromechanical chip, which is made out of silica. So it does kind of have a, a sort of a rubbery um, uh, property to it. And uh, that proof mass is then therefore able to move. Uh, very, very slightly uh, back and forth. All right, we talk accelerometer then just like a mass on a spring. And in order to do that, um, I actually developed, oh, and I'm sorry, um, it appears my internet connection is a little unstable. So it's my apologies. Hopefully that clears up in the next minute or two. Um, so yeah, I actually developed a uh, VPython simulation where the mass is attached to two sets of springs um, along the two two-dimensional axes. And then it's given kind of like bump, the same way that you know your phone might receive a bump, right? So some kind of a, a, a 
an applied force over a short period of time. And so then you can see sort of that oscillatory motion as it, it dies down. And so we can use these relations to kind of get at what's going on inside the phone. And then students, therefore, when they go on to take data uh, in the lab, have a better sense of actually what's going on inside the phone. And that in and of itself can be very, very useful. Um, excellent. So we actually, uh, and I'll just talk very briefly about this. We actually developed a whole series of labs which solely rely on data collection mechanisms from the MyTech app and a computer with a webcam. The reason why the webcam is handy is because the MyTech app collects acceleration. And you might think to yourself, okay, well then I can, once I have acceleration as a function of time, I can then uh, go back and, and look at velocity versus time by integrating and so on. But that integration method doesn't work particularly well. because of sort of the integration constants that are injured um, when, um, due to the, the hardware and the software, therefore making some estimates as to, as to the motion of the device. So um, getting velocity from the app doesn't work particularly well. Acceleration does, but velocity does not. And so using a computer with a webcam paired with some free video analysis software like Tracker that we discussed earlier can be really um, a perfect pairing. And so we we're able to uh, create an entire uh, curriculum based on um, the use of the smartphone as a, their primary data collection device. Uh, the first one, we just explored the axes on the smartphone. Uh, then we talked about free fall. And so we talked about the fact that the acceleration should sort of jump up to zero during that time. We looked at motion with a fan, impulse and momentum, physical pendulum and rotation. So a lot of different elements kind of went into this. And as we were developing the app, what we wanted to do was address a lot of the pedagogical and sort of instructional challenges that had been introduced by other apps that were out on the market. So on the free um, app market. So we looked at the pre-existing apps that were out there that were doing a lot of the same things that our intended app would, right? They were collecting data from sensors. Uh, one of the ones that we looked at was AndroSensor, which um, is uh, an incredibly robust app. It, it accesses a lot of different data simultaneously. Um, but there were some instructional challenges that, that we uh, identified when we tried to use it in the lab. And the first one was just that because it collects so much data, it can create this excess cognitive load on students and therefore it can actually be more confusing and can sort of take the emphasis away from the parts that we were trying to emphasize. So our solution was to really focus on the features that would be most commonly used. And so we actually studied the way that students navigated through these apps and um, really built the interface based on that. Another challenge that we determined was this difficulty in recognizing the internal axes of the phones. Um, and so we created this small legend. We also added some, some help articles with some, some big visualizations to help students understand that. And kind of paired with that, students also had some, conf uh, some confusion regarding what the axis of interest would be in, in, the, 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 in their experiment. So they would know, for example, what the X, Y, and Z axes were, but they weren't sure which one would be most important to them in any given particular experiment. And that's completely understandable when you're just kind of given an onslaught of, of data from three different axes, knowing which ones to kind of filter out mentally can be a bit of a challenge. So we added some help art articles, we added some interactive buttons um, so that students could actually just sort of highlight the one that they were interested in. And the other really uh, uh, big instructional challenge that we encountered was that students spent a lot of time graphing the data just to find out that the data wasn't particularly good. And so they would have to export all of their data to something like a CSV file, which they would then email to themselves and open up in something like Excel. All of that just took time. And it wouldn't be until the time that they've graphed in Excel that they realized that, oh, shoot, that doesn't work. I'm going to need to, um, to look elsewhere and, um, and potentially redo the experiment. So we added a browse function as well. But all of this is to say that we were trying to answer the problems that we had seen with some existing apps. You know, we added the visualization of the spring model, like I discussed before. We added um, a, uh, uh, 
I think, a Wash Help article explaining that spring model. And the idea of this was to try to get at the idea that that understanding what's going on inside the black box is really important. And this is something that goes back even to Arnold Ahrens, uh, one of the former presidents of AAPT. There are a lot of concerns about black boxes and technology kind of um, uh, uh, covering up in some way what's actually going on physically inside of a system. And I, and I think there's some truth to that. Um, I, I understand and really relate to these issues. You know, I can't just open up my car engine and see what's going wrong anymore, right? It's a lot harder to do because it's all covered in plastic. It's literally a black box. So how do I get around that? Um, the way that we get around that is by making our technology more transparent, by helping students understand physically what's going on in our simulations to help them uh, gain a deeper understanding of what's going on. So um, at this point, I think I'd like to um, stop talking and um, uh, try to answer whatever questions you might have. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Colleen. Um, so anybody who has a question, feel free to either put it in the chat or the Q&A feature. We'll be looking at both. Uh, we do have one um, already in the Q&A feature. Um, it says, I did a similar type of setup for an upper level course and noticed um, his optional hours were used by some students earlier in the semester and then dropped off greatly as the semester went on. Did that happen to you? Did you have similar experiences? Yeah, I did. And I kind of feel like that trend, if anything, has amplified um, even over the course of multiple semesters. <laughs> um, I, I think there's something, I, I, I don't have an answer for this one, um, but I can say that I have experienced that same thing. And, and I wish that I did have a solution for that because I do miss students just kind of popping in and feeling comfortable um, popping in. I think it's one thing for a student to feel comfortable, just like, oh, hey, I saw your door is open. You know, do you mind if I pop my head in for a second? And I think there's a higher potential barrier to going into a Zoom session and kind of having this all of a sudden you're now one on one with the instructor. And I think it it there's this um, daunting presence to it um, that I think is really challenging to overcome. Um, I did find at least uh, last semester in the fall when I when I called them coffee with Colleen and I just encouraged people to hey drop by we're gonna we can talk about anything that um, students actually did do that and this semester I maybe because we're in the hybrid mode this semester I felt like I was maybe going back to my old crutches and I just referred to them as, as office hours again. Um, I have gotten way fewer students and and I don't know completely. Um, yeah, what what to do about that. Um, I do wish that more students came. I have encouraged students. I've actually given uh, credit sometimes, um, course credit for, for just dropping by office hours, like come once in a semester, come once before the first test or something like that, just so that uh, they can see that hopefully it's maybe not as scary as it might seem. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. It uh, looks like we have a comment that Shoot, the yeah, MCSU MyTech app is not compatible with the Android phone Android phone yet. <laughs> Great. Okay, Pixel 5, so current Google phone. Yeah, all right, awesome. Thanks, Brendan. I, I will let, um, we've got, uh, you know, obviously I'm no longer at NC State, um, but uh, I do know the, the primary developer over there, so I'll, I'll drop him a line and let him know. Thank you so much, Brendan. That's really, that's very helpful information. <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. Um, Great. If there are any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, otherwise, is there anything else that you wanted to mention? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I just want to thank you so much, Michaela, for hosting. And um, yeah, thanks, SBS, for uh, letting me come out and talk a little bit about remote labs. Hopefully, people found some of the resources helpful. I know, at the very least, just that huge spreadsheet um, was, was really helpful for me. So yeah. That was really impressive. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. And I, I cannot lay any claim to that. That, that was uh, all the work of somebody else and um, incredible work at that. So yeah, really, really helpful. Awesome. Um, well, it looks Great. like there's no other questions. So I just wanted to say thank you again uh, for your second virtual colloquium. Um, mm. I really enjoyed listening. I'm sure everybody found it super helpful. Uh, so everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, and we hope to see you at our next one. Awesome. Thanks so much again, Michaela. Thank you.